Well, we're obviously looking at the latter part of um, the section that Dave read, read to us. I presume from Matthew chapter 5, reading from verses 10 to 12, really, talking about the persecuted. And um, what we'd have to say, first of all, this morning is this, that persecute, uh, peacemakers, I should say, may well be persecuted. That's quite possible. Peacemakers may well be persecuted. But we're told such will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's really what we're looking at today as we're going to consider this last beatitude. Um, Jesus has been speaking and he's been using these beatitudes that we call to speak about the Christian and the Christian's character. Now he's not talking about super spiritual people here. He's not talking about special people. He's talking about ordinary Christians like yourselves and me this morning. And he's saying blessing and, and true joy are promises that he promises to those who are truly his followers. Also, there will be characteristics that will be evident to those who are following the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, there's an illustration I came across, I used it this morning actually, I wouldn't I can speak about it now. But it's like as if you've got a, as you know I love dogs, you, you, you've got a man walking on the road with two dogs behind him. Uh, which dog belongs to him? Well, when he turns right down the path to the house that he's going to, the dog that belongs to him will follow him. The other dog will walk on by. And really, that's really what Jesus is showing you. The true Christian is one who is following the Lord Jesus Christ. There are certain characteristics about them. They've seen that they, though the world looks on them as non-entities, they see them as being those who perhaps think they're poor. Well, we're poor in spirit. Why? Because we've realized we've got nothing that we can actually bring before God. We've come to a position of spiritual poverty. What we've done then is you're a Christian, we kind of mourned over our state, over our position before God, because we realized our sin has separated us from God. And so we come, we don't come proudly before God, we come meekly before Him, seeking His mercy. And we realize we have no right to come before God, but we hunger and thirst for that rightness, that righteousness that He alone can give us in Jesus Christ. <coughs> we can know, therefore, peace within our hearts found in God through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ by putting our faith in what he has done to reconcile us to God. So we become seekers of peace, but we don't become seekers of peace at the expense of truth is what we said. We, we govern and we guide all that we, we, we consider in life upon what God's word has to say. Now we should be those therefore who display something of the evidences of the characteristics of these beatitudes that we see before us this morning. We should display something, we're not perfect, but we should display something of the purity of the life of a Christian. One who is at peace with God and one who knows peace from God. And we are those as much as is possible, always seeking to live at peace with other people. So there's the reality where we are those who are, who are peacemakers, but it's possible that peacemakers become persecuted. So we can know persecution for our faith. We know the blessings from God. And yet we can know opposition. We can know those that will come against us in our faith. Now Jesus Christ is speaking 2,000 years ago. He's talking to his band of believers. He's talking to a crowd which is just outside of his, of his immediate group. And they're living in a day when, they are military, when, the, when the military regime of the day, Rome, occupies their, their nation. And they're knowing difficulties from the regime that runs the, the country. We'd say surely modern man now is a lot more tolerant. We're a lot more easygoing. If we listen to the rhetoric of, of, of our leaders, what they actually say is that we, we should be those who are all inclusive. We need to be those who are, are, are sympathetic to people who have different views to us, different characters, different backgrounds. And yet when it comes to Christianity, it seems to be that they're almost in the West in particular, squeezing out Christianity. Um, I came across a little thing the other day about, I can't remember the full name, but Coco she goes by, the tennis player who won the, um, the, I think the American Open, the youngest tennis player. And when she came down to the end of the, of, the, of the game that she won, she got down on her knees and she was obviously praying. The commentator who was uh, from the particular station was saying, he more or less said, oh, she's absolutely, you know, shattered. She's getting down. She's trying to uh, come to terms with the great event that she's just come, uh, come through. She's won the American Open. And actually what they said was, no, no, she's got down on her knees to pray. 
to give thanks to God. And when they were talking to her, she was talking about her, her Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were trying to, to wipe over it because people don't want to hear today in the West, seemingly, anything about the Christian faith. We're, we're being squeezed out with all the tolerance they tell us we should have. Now, it said in this world, and I checked again, Mr. Google, this morning, but I, he told me this morning that on this planet there's around 8 billion people. That's the, the, the amount of people on the planet at this moment. And yet, as we look at Great Britain in particular, we could easily be depressed as Christians, couldn't we? They did a survey in 2011 and they said 59% of the country profess to be Christians. Now that's nominal, committed and so forth, but 59% of the country in 2011. In 2020, I think it was, there was it was down to 2021, two, down to 2000, sorry, down to 46%. And that's saying nominal people just kind of say we're Christians and people who are, are Christians. And yet worldwide, again, the, the nominal acknowledgement of those who claim to be Christians out of 8 billion people, 2.38 billion people profess to be Christians. Throughout this world, 2.38 profess to be Christians. So in a world where we're supposed to be tolerant, we're supposed to accept people's different views, we've got a world which says 2.8 million people profess to be Christians. Yet it's said, and again Mr. Google confirmed this to me, it's said around 360 million, 360 million professing Christians worldwide were persecuted for their faith last year. 360 million people. And we're talking again all shades and colours and, and, and commitments and so forth. But 360 million people were said to be persecuted or being afflicted for their belief and their faith in Jesus Christ. In actual fact, it says 5,898 people were put to death for their faith in Jesus Christ last year. Over 5,000. In 2022, over nearly 6,000 people were put to death for their faith in Jesus Christ. So, Jesus' sermon is still relevant 2,000 years on than it was in the day in which he lived. In John 15 and verse 20, Jesus said himself, If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If, Timothy tells us in 2 Timothy 3 verse 2, if we desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, we will suffer persecution. <coughs> well, that's what scripture is saying. 2,000 years ago, the statistics that I've just given qualify the fact that that's still the same 2,000 or so years on. So you see, there's a, there's a conflict in this life between the Christian faith and the non-Christian and it does seem ironic that peacemakers, those who preach good news, those who preach, you can know peace with God through faith in Christ, those who are peacemakers can know persecution. Those who preach good news can be persecuted. It, it's amazing to think in this era in which we live, people are persecuted for the Christian faith. And yet, verse 10 tells us, happiness belongs to those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Whatever else is confusion or depress depressing, this great truth comes out. This is the kingdom of heaven. Now there are two kingdoms in this world, whether we believe it or not. Two kingdoms. There's a kingdom of darkness, is the kingdom of light. The ruler of the kingdom of darkness, we're told, is Satan. The ruler of the kingdom of light is the king of kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's conflict between, between the two. Jesus is the king of the kingdom of light. So who are blessed? Those who are persecuted. Those who we've already mentioned from verses 3 to 9, who have spoken, who, who Jesus spoken about as those who are right with God. They're the blessed ones. So that Christians seek to walk in the light of Jesus Christ, who is the light, then 
sometimes that path is going to be hard because shouldn't the servant tread the path that the master trod first? And he was put to death. It's a blessed position of peace with God. It's a blessed position of peace with God. The Christian knows the blessed position of having an inner assurance and peace. But he's saying, don't be surprised. Peacemakers may well be persecuted. You see, we can expect, and we should expect, if we're true followers of Jesus Christ, we will suffer some degree of persecution. Revelation 6 and verses 9 to 11 speaks of those who will be killed for their faith. In other words, those who will be martyred. And if you go back right to the beginning of time in Genesis, we find there is Abel, who's a man who was righteous, a man who worshipped God as he wanted, and he had a brother called Cain. And Cain was envious of him. Cain was jealous of him. Cain, Cain had his own thoughts of what God really wants, how he should live his religious life. And it didn't sit with what God wanted. Abel did. And in the end, it led to jealousy. It led to the first murder in this world. Remember Moses. He chose not the way of the Egyptians. He chose the way of God. Hebrews 11 and verse 25 tells us, Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. The blessed person may well be a persecuted person. So persecution can be a mark of discipleship, of true discipleship. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29 says this, For you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him or in him, but to suffer for his sake. That's the Christian's position. Now, it's a blessed position because we are to be those who if we suffer, we only suffer for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Well, our position now is that we may well be persecuted for righteousness on account of being attached to Jesus Christ. The cross then and the cross now often brings derision. It often brings opposition in our lives. How many people have you read of or heard of who have been offended because some woman or some man wore a cross to work? Now, whatever you think of you wearing crosses, they're irrelevant. But you hear of nurses, you hear of people who wear a cross, and they're told they, they shouldn't be doing that. They shouldn't be offending people in the workplace. And one of the dangers for the Christian church today and for ourselves is this. We don't want to be offensive. We don't want to be um, a problem. We want to be accepted. So we do say as much as is possible, we want to live at peace with all men. But that doesn't mean we hide our light under a bushel. Otherwise, there's something wrong with our Christian life. We are to be careful never to criticize, we think, because if we criticize, we'll end up knowing affliction and problems. We sometimes feel we better turn the blind eye because if I look at that, I'll get involved with that, I'll, 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 I'll be in trouble. We can accept the world's new ethics and morals of the day and just say, well, that's the age in which we live. And I think I mentioned before, but religious education now has changed the title. It's called Religious Values and Ethics. That's what they call it in school now. It's religious values and ethics. It's not about religious instructions. It's about you know, the ethics, the thinking of the day, the morals of the day. You're not to speak of sin. You're not to speak of judgment. You're not to speak to, of hell. I was talking to someone recently, and the person was saying to me, you know, I think I, yeah, I do believe in God. I, I, I call myself an Anglican. If I sign anything, I always say I'm C of E. And he said, I do believe there's something after this life. And I said, well, that's right. I believe that wholeheartedly. The problem I got is, I said, people don't really think about what the Bible says. Because the Bible says there is something after this life, but there's two destinations after this life. There is a heaven to be gained, and there's a hell that is to be shunned. And I said, unfortunately, that's what the Bible says. There is a heaven, but there is also a hell. And people don't want to hear that. It's, it's offensive. We are trying to be in the day in which we live, to be all-inclusive. 
don't say the only way to God is through faith in Jesus Christ. That's being bigoted and, 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 and you know, considering other people's views. And with the, the fallen values, and we can be those that suddenly blend into the age, can't we? The jokes that are told, we just kind of take them and smile at them. Why? Because if we, if we blend nicely, we will not know persecution. It's a sobering thought that in Luke chapter 9 and verse 26, Jesus says, Whoever will be ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man shall be ashamed. So if we're ashamed to stand for the Christian faith here, he says, I'll be ashamed of you on that day of judgment. Now in the 21st century, in the West, the conflict is the same as it was in the 1st century in the Middle East. Tensions were always there. What do we do? What do we not do? What do we compromise in our faith? If you can imagine living in the first century, uh, say you're a, a builder, a carpenter, whatever they would have been, and they want to build a structure in their, in their pagan temple, and you need work, you need money, so do you go and work in the temple and say, well, I'll have to put this beautiful building right for them? Well, at first century Christian would have that tension I don't think I should be doing something which is going to bring people to pagan pagan worship or you're a, you're a first century Christian and you're working for a, for a boss or for an employer who wants you to be dishonest and wants you to lie about certain things what do you do well you could say well I, I need to feed my family I've got to work but because you're a follower of Jesus Christ you say well there's certain things I won't do and if you became a Christian in the first century, and it's the same today in many countries, and you were Jewish, you were excommunicated from your family. You wouldn't be allowed to go into the synagogue, which was the center of the culture of the day. You'd have been excommunicated. It meant, you know, perhaps losing face with your family. And you could say, well, I, I need to be loyal to my family first, and then Jesus Christ second. Now, I actually believe family is vitally important. And I feel we've got to do all we can to keep families together. And I got to be careful my kids are here, but I, 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 I'll do as much as I can to tolerate many things that I perhaps wouldn't be happy with. But there are certain things, and there are certain things the children will know, that I have certain principles on certain things that I will not accept. And I, and I, I won't give in. And I, I mean, my kids know if they come down from away and it's a Sunday, I'm going to be in church. They, they know that. So if they come down, they'll have to put up with it. Because I go to church on a Sunday twice. Three times sometimes. But they, they, they understand that that's the certain things. Although I want to keep peace and harmony as much as is humanly possible in a family, there will be times when we have to hold to our principles and stand upon certain things that we believe are right and we've got values. You could be reviled or spoken against. I mean, imagine today we're in a different era from when I... Well, just about, I suppose, from when I was young. But I mean, the, the, the common thought today is, and I don't want to be crude, but the common thought today is that if you want to have sex before you're married, you, you have sex before you're married. That's the common thing of the day since the introduction of the pill in the 60s. Suddenly everything's able now, which you couldn't have been quite so free and easy in days gone by. So a young Christian couple who are growing up, do they go with the flow, go with the day, or do they say, actually, we, we're keeping that for marriage. That's something which is important. Never mind the sexual drive or the thinking of the day. <coughs> the, they decide to step back from the silly drinking culture that we've got in our country. And do they say, well, yeah, but everybody, is, you know, everybody drinks, everybody gets it. Or does a Christian say, well I, well, I don't really want to be part of that culture in the day in which I live. With all the abuse that goes on, it's connected to alcohol and so forth. And then in a the workplace, you say, well, I want to be reliable, I want to be upright. It doesn't matter what people are doing round about me. Being careful how we speak, the language we use, and so forth. Not looking down or putting other people down. What response do they expect, or do we expect? Well, Jesus tells us in John 3, 20, 21, that we're to shine in the days of darkness. Now, the darker the night, the brighter the light. The darker the day, the brighter the Christian should be seen. Or are we driven by the conflict or the thinking of the age which may bring conflict if we stand against it? Verse 11, even with such a reaction, 
we can be blessed and even in such times we can know false accusations and what can we do <laughs> we can actually we can rejoice and be glad remember our lord was abused he was just taken advantage of eventually he was even killed so we follow actually a crucified savior even religious people would think that to persecute christians is right john 16 verse 2 it says they will put you out of the synagogue yes the time is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering god a service there will be religious people who would say those christians are too fanatical and they need to be stopped god allows us to be tested jesus never said following him would be easy he says take up your cross and follow me so peacemakers may well be persecuted but such will inherit the kingdom of god verse 12. how can we be glad how can we rejoice well you see we've got an eternal reward we will be made up more than we ever lost in this life the hardships that we that we've known we will inherit the kingdom of heaven and great is our reward it says so all these beatitudes have promises here's a great promise they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven <clears throat> so looking forward to that great day when all the wrongs will be put right when all the, the tears will be wiped away when there will be no more pain there will be no more sin that's what the christian will be remember acts 5 and verse 41 do you know the, the apostles actually counted it a privilege to suffer for the name of jesus christ they didn't go away whinging and saying we've been in prison we've been beaten i mean what they went away saying they were thankful that they were counted worthy to be able to suffer for jesus christ in those days there were people being put to the lions they were being put to the gladiators they were being burned at the stake they were actually those christians who were put around rome and, and burned at the stake around rome because they, they wouldn't bow to the deity of, of, of Caesar of the day or what have you. And for those first 300 years, there were martyrs that were put to death for the Christian faith. And then you follow it throughout history. That, you see, that's been the case. But they have a great weight of glory ahead of them. The message was applicable to them. It's the same to us. It hasn't changed. Jesus prayed for them and he, he prays for us also as we, we go through this scene of time. In, in John 15 and verse 18 there it says, If the world hates you, says Jesus, you know, it hated me before it hated you. And if you were of the world, the world would love you its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will persecute you. If you keep my word, they will keep yours also. Verse 1 of chapter 16. These things I've spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. Jesus prepared his disciples. He gave them no false illusions. He said, you're living in hard days. The first 300 years would be hard days. Things changed under Constantine, perhaps for the better or for the worse or whatever. But for the first 300 years, they went through hard times. We're led to believe all the apostles, apart from John, were martyred. The 11 apostles were put to death for their faith. And some of their death would have been horrendous deaths. And if you go throughout church history, you can read it. I've never seen the back room there. There are books. If you ever see the books on the shelf, if you want one, you can take it home with you. And they just make a note that you take it and bring it back. And there should be someone in there, um, Fox's Book of Martyrs. And it tells the story of over the centuries, the Christians who have had themselves, their children, their partners, whatever, put to death for their faith. Some horrendous deaths. Because the world is hostile to really committed Christians. People do not want to hear that they're sinners. They don't want to hear they need a saviour. So Christians will be insulted. They will be told lies about. But the Christian should only be persecuted for righteousness sake. Verse 11 towards the end there. 
for the sake of Jesus Christ. Now, I actually believe this. No religion should be persecuted. I'm not about persecuting Muslims. And I don't think we always treated the, the Roman Catholic faith in the right way around the time of the Reformation. There were some silly things were done by Protestants as well. So I don't think we should be persecuting other faiths. They can go their own way if they want. But we can run into trouble sometimes, not because of we're persecuting other people, but because of our character. Perhaps some of us are very confrontational. Some of us can be a little bit outspoken. Sometimes we lack wisdom. And Brian's been going through James, and he's told us we, we sometimes struggle with our tongue, what we say, how we speak, our attitude towards other people. And we can know persecution because of our character, because of our failings. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 14 to 16 there. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On, the part he is, on their part he's blasphemed, but on your part he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in the matter. In other words, there are times when we can be persecuted because we're awkward characters or because we're not particularly nice to people. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the fact that we stand on the Christian faith and we, we get persecuted for what we believe. Chapter 5 and verse, I think it's verse 44 and verse 45 there. He says, but I say to you, unto you, I don't mind the Muslims, can't be, whatever their faith, faith says, faith be. He says, I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. He makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. So, actually, we're supposed to pray for those who misuse us and take advantage of us. Verse 10, 12, should say, tells us, even in persecution, you see, we can rejoice. That's why in Philippians 4, verse 4, Paul says, Rejoice always, and again I say, rejoice. That's not possible, is it? That's, if you're being persecuted, you can't rejoice, naturally speaking. But in Mark chapter 10 and verse 27, we're told that what is not possible with man is possible with God. Grace can enable us to do what is impossible. See, we always need to keep a heavenly perspective in all the times, but especially in times of persecution. We will know difficult times. We can know very hard times. Somebody said to me the other day, they said, um, our generation, it's my generation, not some of you, we've been probably one of the most privileged generations. We have no war. We haven't really known, well, some of us knew poverty in early life, but certainly not in the, in the latter, latter days. We, we've had, perhaps in many ways, the easy days, haven't we? So we can lose a sense of our eternal perspective. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 17 and 18 there. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is actually working for us a far more exceedingly eternal weight of glory. You see, we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen, they're only temporary, you're not taking anything with you. But the things which are not seen, they're eternal. In times of hardship, Christians have suffered terribly. But we're told to be faithful in Revelation 2 verse 10, even if it brings us to death. So it's important to know we're not just stoic people, religious. and We have a faith in God found in Jesus Christ, which gives us that enabling spirit that causes us to be joyful even in hard times putting Christ first in everything I've mentioned <coughs> him before but Jim Elliot who was mar mar uh, put to death by the Zorker Indians who later came to faith some of them he said didn't he he is no fool who gives up what he cannot gain but he cannot look sorry, sorry rather, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Not a fool to give up what you can't have here. You've given it up because you've got eternal life. He goes on to say, which often isn't quoted, 
God also gives the best to those who leave the choices with him. Gives the best to those who leave the choices with him. If it's a day of persecution, we just learn to rest in him. And if we're living in a day when there's no persecution, perhaps it may say something about the church and about our own lives. So peacemakers may be persecuted, but such will inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Let's close our service then and sing our, <coughs> our final hymn, which is 583. Jesus, on my eye, my cross have taken, all to leave and follow thee, destitute, despised, forsaken, thou from hence my, sh my all shall be. Perish every fond ambition, all I've sought and hoped and known, yet how rich is my condition. God and heaven are still mine own. 583. Father, we are with on by faith and winged by power. We think of heaven's eternal day before us. 
God's own hand, we're told, will guide us. Soon shall close our earthly mission. Swift shall pass our pilgrim days. Hope soon changed to glad fruition. Faith to sight and prayer to praise. Ever keep our heavenly perspective before us, we pray, Lord. And go with us now and bless us, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.